Ready to go. All right, thank you. Can I invite people to come back in and take their seats? And it's exactly one o'clock, so I'm going to try and keep us on time this afternoon. If I could ask people to come in again, please, thank you. Take your seats. So this afternoon, we've got a very busy schedule, and we're hoping to be done by 4.30. I do want to point out a couple of things. First of all, the last part of the conference is a roundtable session, and that's intended to be the chance that you will have to ask questions and talk about some of the issues that have been raised. I will also point out that many of us are going to stay past the 4.30 for the reception and networking, um, and hopefully we'll have some time for a little bit more formal questions um, in the first part of the afternoon. So. Um, I'd like to now take a different approach for the next session. We have six very special speakers who are going to talk about surgery of nets, uh, medical therapy, interventional radiology, PRRT, and immunotherapy. And instead of having everybody come up to the top, to the podium and stop in between each lecture, I'm going to ask all of our speakers to come up to the podium. We've arranged six chairs for them up here. I'm going to introduce everybody now. So please, speakers, come up to the front so I can point you out and introduce you properly. Um, and that way, they will be able to come up and give their talks. Hopefully, there'll be some time for questions of all of them at the end if we're able to get through this in a timely fashion, because we do have an extra 15 minutes built in at the very end of this. So the speakers do have to stay on time for us to accomplish this very lofty goal. Okay, so not in order of talks, but in order of seating, I'm going to start with Dr. Dan Rayson, who's at the far end of the table. Dan is a medical oncologist from out east in Canada. Everybody here is Canadian, right? So we're good for this. <laughs> the, the speakers have not all been Canadian, but that's okay. Um, next to him is Dr. Ian McGilvery, who is a uh, net surgeon at UHN in Toronto. He's actually more than just a net surgeon, <laughs> but he likes that for today. Um, seated next to him is Dr. Carmine Simone, who's from the Toronto East General Hospital, a thoracic surgeon who's going to talk about um, lung net surgery. And then we have Dr. Uh, Pat Tafio, who is an immunotherapist, who's going to talk about immunotherapy. Who are, we're missing somebody. And I'm sorry, we haven't met. Uh, Fred. Fred. Hi. Hi. Um, so this is Dr. Fred Arsenault, who is going to talk to us about PRRT. Um, what happened? You're here. Oh. No, come up. We need you up here. Dr. Majumdar, who's going to come to the front, is going to talk to us about interventional radiology. So if we follow the schedule, Ian is going to start, um, followed by Dr. Simone, followed by Dr. Rayson. So we're going through the process the way patients actually do it. First they get their surgery, then they get their medical therapy, then sometimes they're going to need some interventional radiology. Um, and then, if they're lucky in, tr in Canada here, you might get on a clinical trial for some PRRT, and then ultimately immunotherapy. So we're going to go through that. I'm going to step away from the stage and let this elite group moderate themselves until we get to the questions, and then I'll come back up. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> That's already, it's already one of the most exciting panel discussions I think I've ever had. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm, just, I'm just here to talk about, um, where's the slide? Is this the, yeah, the green button for forward? Okay. To talk about surgery for neuroendocrine tumors, but to be specific, I'm, I'm going to limit my comments to surgery of neuroendocrine tumors of the, uh, in the abdomen. And just to make a, a, a fast point about surgery, um, you know, I, I think one of the real questions is what does surgery do? What does it accomplish? And surgery really, surgery really very much, in the simplest terms, is something that is very localized. It, it attacks a local process. If you have a disease in one spot, it will treat 
that spot. So it can be useful if you have disease in a lot of spots, but that's in the context of favorable biology. And that's a point that I think has been made before, but that I really want to highlight in the context of surgery. Surgery helps if the disease favors it, and ultimately, biology trumps everything else. So I run a, um, actually, I run a, I run a basic science lab, and a lot, of, a lot of the talks I give tend to be, you know, graphs here, there, everywhere, heat maps, data, all this stuff. Today, I want to try something different. Today, I'm going to give I mean, what amounts to three, three stories that highlight some of the important things that I would bring out anyway, I would hope, with the graphs, about how we approach uh, neuroendocrine tumors from a surgical standpoint in the abdomen. And I want to highlight some of the issues that we face as surgeons about when to operate, who to operate on, and really the fundamental question that we're asking ourselves is who is going to benefit from an operation? So again, I said early on that I think biology trumps everything. I think that's really fundamentally true. So there are a few words about the biology of neurotic tumors, and I'm just, I'm not basing the, on this, this on anything except experience. And I will say that as an entity, neuroendocrine tumors have one of the most shockingly diverse spectrums of clinical behavior of anything else around. I mean, you have people who have cascading, accelerating disease that uh, is horrific and, and lasts a few weeks, for which you have very few treatment options. And then you have people who go on very well for year upon year upon year. And those are the people that we tend to have many more treatment options for. As a rule, low-grade cancers do better, high-grade cancers do worse, but there are exceptions to all of that. And every patient is different. And from my own standpoint, the thing that seems to be the most discriminatory in terms of how people are going to do in the long term is just that, is time. Time is a huge variable. If you do well over time, you likely have more options. And that's when surgery in particular becomes becomes relevant. So I'm going to talk about three cases who had surgery. The first two are ones that I've, I've dealt with in the last few months. The other one is one that I've dealt with over the last 10 years. Um, the first one is a uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with localized disease, but it's locally aggressive. And really what I'm getting at here is kind of the limits of surgery and what we can offer and whether we should offer it. The second case is a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with nodal met, so the sort of the first stage metastasis, and what are the implications of that, and how can we deal with it, and how aggressive should we be at dealing with it. And the third case is a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with liver metastases, which is one of the more common places for these tumors to, to spread to, and where, again, there are a lot of options. So first case is a, is a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that's locally aggressive. Now, I, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to tell this story mostly using, mostly using pictures. And you may ask, why am I using pictures? And it's because um, in the last 20 years, I've had four kids, and the youngest is four years old. So that means for 20 years, I've had unrelenting picture books. <laughs> so I talked about graphs and looking at graphs. I'll be absolutely honest with you. At these points, I can't interpret a graph to save my life. But if you want me to find Waldo <laughs> in a field of fluorescent pink bunny rabbits, I can do it. So I'm going to use mostly pictures. Now the pictures are, actually I asked my team, I have a team of of really talented biomedical communications people. And about eight years ago, whoops, hold on, let's go back. Can we go back one? The red one? No, that's all right, we'll start here. Can you start the video? So it, I have a team, about eight years ago, we started a, a video atlas, and uh, basically the idea is to tell stories using animation to tell video. Can you get that, is that video not working now? It's timed, it's, very, it's a very impressive thing. You know, I, so I once went down to the Mayo, because my whole thing is about video atlases, right? And it's about animations and modeling and technology and all the rest of it. And I get there, and I'm standing in front of Grand Rounds, like hundreds of people, and they're televising it all over the Mayo in, in, in Rochester, and this happens. <laughs> so I can tell you, it's actually a very impressive animation. <laughs> and I just really wanted to kind of give credit to the people who made the following pictures and maybe that's a picture of them, like who knows? <laughs> anyway, so I just wanted to give credit to that. I also kind of wanted to highlight the fact that we have a video atlas because it's, it's actually, it does have patient education material on it. So if you're 
curious about some of the things that we're talking about and some of the, we, we have animation driven patient education modules that you can go to for some of the operations I'm talking about. So the first case is a 44 year, and I've altered the details so this is anonymous, but this is a 44 year old woman with vague abdominal pain who on imaging turned out to have this huge tumor that was originating in the head of the pancreas. And the problem with it, um, I mean, there were no distant mets. The, the problem with this tumor is that it, its local extent, because what it has done is it ate into the venous system. There's a vein that runs through the pancreas, and this thing ate into it and expanded. And in fact, the bulk of the tumor is actually expansion of, the, of this vein. And as a result, you wind up with these horrible venous collaterals around the whole thing, in addition, which, which bleed, of course, and, and they've got a lot of pressure and they're thin-walled. And in addition to that, the whole tumor is wrapped around this previous enteric artery. So the blood supply to the intestine and the abdomen is completely compromised, both the artery and the vein. So not surprisingly, and quite reasonably, this was, this was deemed initially unresectable. And then it was sent to us to see whether we could offer transplantation type techniques to deal with it. And uh, you can do that, but it's difficult because really what you have to do is find a way of taking the tumor out and creating a field without blood, in essence, and then rebuilding all these veins and arteries and then putting everything back in. So what we did with that was divide the organs, so the stomach and, the, and basically the mid part of the colon and then all the blood vessels going into it. And then you can take everything out, take everything out of the abdomen, flush it on the back bench like I would for a transplant, what is a transplant? And then carefully remove the tumor in the pancreas, take a graft, rebuild the vessels, and then put everything back in. And that's, it was, it's, a, it's a complicated kind of thing. It took about 17 hours. Now, she actually, well, that's not bad, actually, for these cases. They, they, they tend to be even longer. So she did, um, she did very well. She was home in 10 days. And her pathology showed a pancreatic neurodegenerative tumor, and the, and the proliferative index was only 10%. Margins are negative, so she's, in essence, disease-free, which is kind of cool. But it didn't happen without a cost because we had to put a protective ileostomy in to divert the bowel, and that's had some really high outputs. So she's been into merge about three times in the last few months with high outputs. So we're, we're, we're going to reverse that in the next few weeks, and hopefully that'll be the end of it. But the point here is that aggressive surgery can be warranted if you have localized disease, and again, if the biology favors it. Second case. This is a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with a nodal metastasis that's in an awkward location. So neuroendocrine tumors, and especially pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, are a bit odd. They, go, they can sometimes spread to lymph nodes, even in the absence of a very visible primary. So the lymph node is the first part of the, of the, of the immune system, if you like. It's kind of like an, another blood system, you know, artery, vein, lymph node. You get these little solid lumps, and it's the first place that these tumors can go. And sometimes, you'll see these, these tumors go to lymph nodes without ever being able to find the primary. You remove the lymph node and people will be fine, they'll be cured. So we, we always think, well, we should remove it if we can on, on those grounds. So this lady, again, let's, let's, say, let's say she's 43. Actually, I made it 44, but then I realized it was the same age as before. So let, let's call her 43. She too presents with vague abdominal pain. Now she's got this, so she had a, a tumor in the neck of the pancreas, right there, and then behind that she has this clump of lymph nodes that's distinct from the tumor that's actually the problem. Uh, and this was actually originally presumed to be an adenocarcinoma, which is a completely different kettle of fish from a neuroendocrine tumor. Adenocarcinoma is universally aggressive, and we, we do offer surgery on the arteries and veins, but we're pretty um, uh, selective in who we, in who we choose. But then she was biopsied and turned out to be a neuroendocrine tumor, which shifted everything. This is the problem. So she has this nodal met, and it's jammed up against the aorta, which is the main artery that supplies the, supplies the abdomen and supplies the legs. And it's wrapped around the first big artery, which is the celiac, and then it's wrapped around the second big artery, which is the SMA. So it's kind of the same problem as before. You've got these nodal mets, and they're just hugging these major vessels. So she had a very complicated very complicated problem because she, for about a year, so we actually saw her in our center originally, one of my partners did, and presented her at our multidisciplinary boards, but the diagnosis was that she had an adenocarcinoma, so she was turned down from surgery. And then the biopsy came back, 
as a neuroendocrine tumor, but because she'd already been slotted into this adenocarcinoma mindset, if you like, there was a real reluctance to offer surgery. So then she went from Toronto down to New York, and she goes down to New York, and she sees one of the people in Mount Sinai, and he said, because he'd never seen this before, so he says, well, okay, it's an aggressive entity, but I think we should think about operating. And then he says, oh, wait, hold on, you're from Canada. And she says, yeah. And he says, well, well I know this guy. He works in Canada. He works in this place called, oh, yeah, Toronto. <laughs> so then she comes back to Toronto, and we reassess her with, with this, you know, basically with a clean slate and decide to go ahead. And what we did was do a distal pancreatectomy, which is where you remove the tail of the pancreas. And then we're faced with this thing that's wrapped around these, these vessels. And it turned out she had, a, we were thinking actually that we'd have to replace these, that we'd have to rebuild them, because we'd take some leg veins and then we'd rebuild them. But as it turns out, we could just take the celiac artery because she had a replaced hepatic artery system. I mean, the details aren't important, just that we managed to avoid rebuilding it. And we actually teased it away from the superior mesenteric arteries. So she actually did quite well. She was home in seven days. But again, there's a cost to this because when you deal with these arteries, when you deal with these veins, you screw up the nerves that go to the intestine. So she's had some pretty vicious diarrhea with this. She's lost about 20 pounds. And she's had a phenomenal emotional stress around this, as you can imagine. I mean, a whole year of back and forth. And you're unresectable, you're resectable, you're unresectable, maybe, maybe not. So we've, we've hooked her up with people to help with that, but I have to acknowledge I don't think we've done a particularly good job with that at, at any point of dealing with the stress involved with the primary diagnosis or anything that goes around it. Third case. So this is, I think I changed the age. So this is a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that spreads to the liver. So 46, 46 year old man presents vague abdominal pain, which, which is often the case, right? So he actually Back in 2004, one of my partners did a Whipple operation on him. And what a Whipple is, is to take the head of the pancreas away, last part of the stomach, first part of the intestine, bile duct, and then rebuild all that. That was back in 2004. He's fine up until about 2009 when he shows up with a little spot in segment five of the liver. At that point, he's on long-acting somatostatin. Despite that, it grows. He has no other disease in the rest of the liver. So... In two, at the end of 2009, we do a wedge resection of segment five, which is a pretty straightforward liver operation after all. And he, now, it's a straightforward liver operation, but again, there's a cost to it. So he wound up with an infection in the bed. We had to drain it. Then he had a hernia. Then we fixed the hernia with a mesh. The mesh got infected. We had to take that out. We had to repair it. So we dealt with the disease, but he certainly had a cost to it. Then in 2012, he starts having other lesions. So he's fine up to that point. But then in 2012, he starts having other liver lesions. So we embolize him. Bland embolization, which kills the arterial flow to those metastases. Actually does pretty well. And then we ablate, I think, one or two that came up after that. That controlled it. But over time, he had these persistent growing lesions. But they're anatomically segmented. And that's the thing about the liver. That's the thing that I think about with the liver. It's, an, it's a remarkable organ. It, it grows back. It grows back in about six weeks. So if you have something where you can get decent flow in, decent flow out, and you've got a decent size, you can do amazing things. And the liver will grow back. So in his case, now keep in mind, this is 2014, so it's 10 years after his initial surgery. So we take out the right side of his liver and we wedge some things in the left. And then over time, he's fine. So 2015, no disease. Liver looks a bit like a boxing glove. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. I, I sort of see a polar bear, personally. But that may just be personality, yeah. <laughs> So, but then, then 2016, he starts getting these damn things again, because they, they, which, is the, which is all too often the, you know, the history of these things. The things come back in the liver. So we bland embolize them again, which shrinks and, and basically kills all but one tumor. That tumor grows. At this point, he's done an everolimus treatment, the mTOR inhibitor that was mentioned before. The main thing is still growing. So we zap it with external beam radiation therapy and actually does pretty well. So that was back in 2017 and he's been stable up until now. So that's a 13 year history of this kind of progressive creature. Um, this is the sort of person who if it weren't for the fact that it, during all this he developed, he actually developed a metastasis in his, in his left shoulder blade. If it weren't for that, this is the sort of person we think about transplanting, we think about doing a liver transplant on because he's had his primaries controlled the original proliferative index, I can't remember what it was, but it was, pretty, it was pretty limited, pretty low. 
and the disease would have been li limited to the liver, and that's precisely the person who we would think would benefit from liver transplant. He's out of that because he's got this stupid med outside of it, but that's who we would consider. And I was telling Jackie, actually, that he's actually an example, too, of, I had a patient, I'm sorry, I'm probably a little bit over time, but I won't be long. And anyway, I was, J Jackie organized all this, so I, I'm, I can get an extra minute, yeah? <laughs> Fantastic, okay, so, what's that? And my and that's right. <laughs> it's a little unethical, but we won't we won't talk about that. So um, so a couple of weeks ago, so a couple of months ago, actually, Shreen, as I was involved in this too, we had this lady who had a, a nasty uh, grade three tumor that was growing in the liver, went through his third, third line treatments, nothing was really helping, and uh, she was basically confined to the bed. So we did sort of an urgent right hepatectomy, did remarkably well, went home. I saw her in clinic uh, two weeks ago. And she said, you know what you've done to me, doctor? She said, you have turned me into a whack-a-ball because whenever disease comes up, you're gonna whack it, <laughs> which is exactly what this guy has. And that's, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of my philosophy, you know, with this sort of liver med. You know, you, I, want, I want to turn you into whack-a-moles. I want to be in a situation where I follow things and when they start to move, I hit them without, without pain. So just in conclusion, so I have the surgery in the abdomen, so I think even when warranted, just to be clear, it comes at a cost. Complications, stress, pain. And again, surgery is only one part, and that last case really illustrates it, is one part of an overall global picture. You need medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgical oncology, endocrinology, interventional radiology, and potentially transplantation, although that's something we can talk about at the round table. And it's a, again, it's a local approach to what's a multi-site disease. I think it's warranted if the biology is favorable. Now let's see if this animation works. Yes. There we go. Thank you.